Sao Paulo University in, in Brazil. And then he, he worked as a postdoc in the Autonomous University of Madrid. Later went to Fermilab as a postdoc and now he's an associate scientist there. Um, he's an expert in neutrino physics and he both on just doing, you know, model, UV model building or non-tube model building as well as dealing actually with experiments. Uh, and he also dabbled with dark matter and extended Higgs sectors. Not actually with experiments, but with phenomenology. Um, um, and he also wrote in dark matter and extended Higgs sector and some permutations that link all these three topics together. I think it's Please. better to stop there. You're <laughs> raising the bar. So that's the whole point. Too much expectation. I'm enjoying my job. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to put this in, but you enjoy my job. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it's going to be like, okay. oh. and I will turn on the projection eventually for a plot or so. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so thanks for the invitation for this very nice presentation. It was like the best presentation I ever had. Um, so I'm going to talk about the paper uh, that I I wrote with uh, uh, Babu, with Kaladi Babu, with uh, Alex Friedland and Irina Mosioyu. So it's called uh, what's it called again? Flavor Gauge Models. Uh, I hope you can read my letter below. Let me just do this. Uh, the, the title is not that, but it's the firm scale, but whatever. You, you can get the point. So this is with Babu, uh, Friedland, and uh, Mosioyo. Uh, and let me just write the archive number here in case you guys are interested in me. Uh, zero one eight two two. All right. So um, <clears throat> the question we wanted to ask here was um, was actually uh, about flavor. So there is this usual law that flavor physics needs to live at a very high scale, right? And this is basically mostly on uh, EFTs, on effective field theories. So the idea is that, uh, let me know if I write anything here that you guys cannot see because of the screen or something. Um, but the idea is that, for instance, if you have, uh, if you have an operator like this, uh, let's say, let me just write L you know, everywhere, by less than lambda square, and this has uh, flavor indices, alpha, beta, gamma, and rho. Uh, or, I mean, this is just an example. There could be other operators, but imagine that I have this operator and I don't specify what, well, not that I don't specify, but I don't have flavor conserved in here. So, for instance, imagine that I put a mu on here and three electrons. So, you would have transitions like that, which has very, very strong bounds. Or you could do the same with quarks and, uh, and uh, 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 effects on, for instance, D oscillations would actually uh, give a very strong bounds on this kind of operator. So using effective field theory, if you're not assuming anything about the Wilson coefficient here in front, about the number here in front, it typically, uh, this flavor uh, violating operators typically give a bound on this lambda to be at least at, you know, many, many, many TV. For instance, in the case of the oscillations, a thousand TV. So just to make it a bit more clear, if you have something like this, imagine that this is a D, and this is a D bar, so this is a U, C, U, C, and arrows should point in the right direction, I guess, hopefully. And uh, you have a scalar here. If you just do that and you see the impact on, on D, D bar oscillation, you get a bound that is uh, mass of this scalar divided by the coupling, this, assuming that these couplings here are the same, to be above a thousand T. So because of this kind of arguments, um, it is very common to say that uh, any physics that touches flavor that is not universal in flavor should be very heavy. And what we are going to ask here is, is it, is it true that flavor physics can only be at a high scale? And along with this question, we are also going to address another question that comes for free, which is, uh, can neutrino experiments be sensitive to new physics that collider experiments have not ruled out? I'll make this point a bit more clear uh, later. But the point is that um, effective field theory tells you, tells you that uh, the, the scale of new physics that violates flavor is above about 1,000 TeV. This is, 
this is very much a, a handwork, right? I'm not saying anything here that is super uh, uh, exact. Or if you have minimal flavor violation, uh, it should be about a TV or so. A minimal flavor violation is essentially a scheme in which all flavor violations of the EFT follow the flavor structure of the Sana model. So if you have anything that connects, for instance, a, a top to apps, this thing should be weighted by, uh, by uh, VUB and things like that. Um, I'm not going to enter in details here. There's a way that you can formulate this consistently with spurions and symmetries, etc. but I'm not going to enter in details. So, um, before I go to our model, uh, there has been uh, other works on uh, player physics at, at the low scales. Uh, for instance, one very common example is uh, L mu minus L tau symmetry, in which uh, a lepton number is anomalous, but then when you do L mu minus L tau, you cancel the anomaly, and there uh, you take advantage of the fact that you're coupling uh, to muons and taus, you're not touching the, the quark sector and so on. And people have, have been studied that together with, or not with uh, uh, barrel number or uh, things like that. And um, the, the idea here, the, 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 the motivation for this scenario is to study this scenario at a scale as low as possible is, for instance, if you try to, to explain the G minus 2 of the muon, you want some new physics that talks to muons, but if this new physics talks also to electrons, you're, you're done, right? The bonds are too strong. So with L mu minus L tau, you can try to explain this G minus 2 of the muon. You can try to explain uh, the proton radius puzzle. Um, of course, all these things, uh, uh, you can ask if it's really a puzzle or not, if it's not just a, cal a problem of the, 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 the calculation of the theory. But if you have something that talks uh, to muons and to baryons, you can explain the proton radius puzzle. Uh, also, please interrupt me at any time, right? <coughs> if not, I'll finish in 20 minutes. Um, another thing that people used to try to explain was the Higgs to mu tau uh, signal that now is essentially gone. Uh, but when it was there, you wanted something that talks to muons and taus in such a way that the Higgs can decay to these guys. And one, one interesting part, um, one interesting piece of physics that, that people try to address is what they call the NSI. So NSI stands for uh, non, it's, it's not a very uh, dominated name, non-standard interactions. So that essentially is um, interactions in the neutrino sector with uh, uh, an explicit and uh, a well-defined form Things like, for instance, nu bar, gamma mu, nu. Uh, you put some 2 root 2 g fermi here, some epsilon, and then fermion, gamma mu, fermion. So the idea here is that uh, you put this just to, to, to normalize the weak interaction. And if epsilon is 1, your interaction between neutrinos and whatever fermion is, uh, is uh, essentially the same as the standard model interaction. So what this causes you is that um, no, when the neutrinos propagate in matter, for instance, say that this fermion is a quark, I don't know if you guys can see here, but uh, this, is, I'm just drawing, uh, can you see? Yeah, 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 okay, good. So when neutrinos uh, propagate in matter, um, this new interaction, so here is, it would be the, the sun model interaction, but now you have another interaction like this, uh, QQ for instance, mediated by this, uh, um, uh, term in the Lagrangian that could change the matter potential of the sphere when they traverse matter. So the point is that these non sudden interactions, the way people have written, uh, usually they, they don't respect SU2 invariance. We know that neutrinos come in the doublet, so when you, res when you restore SU2 invariance here, uh, there are charged electrons that typically gives you, gives you much stronger bounds than whatever you can, you can think of measuring with neutrinos. Um, People still write this without the SU2 invariance because uh, the Q square, the, the scale at which this process takes place, is essentially zero momentum transfer, it's a matter potential, while uh, whatever you would see at colliders it is at the energy of the collider. For instance, at the TV, you would have a, a, a sorry, at the LHC, you'd be at the TV scale. So the question is, um, 
can you actually come up with theories that can give you this kind of interaction? So this related to the flavor question, because uh, looking at the neutrino side, any interaction that gives you uh, uh, any interaction that is universal in flavor does not change neutrino propagation in matter, right? Does not change the oscillation pattern. So uh, eventually, this this um, the study of non standard interactions in a more UV complete framework, assuming as a tree invariance, was such a big deal that people came up with uh, bounds from dimension six operators like like this L L let's say Q Q bounds on that, and um, and the bounds are so strong that people started saying like well. Maybe uh, maybe we could be more imaginative and come up with dimension eight operators. Let me just write one for you. Uh, they are all disgusting, uh, so I'll just write one. And I need to look because they they are all disgusting. This is terrible. But let me do it in any case. For instance, this would be a dimension eight operator. I doubt you. Well, let me just do like this. Um, and then gamma. And then where am I? Oh my god, terrible. H tilde transpose L. So this kind of things. Uh, uh, this is a dimension eight operator. Uh, people write that because the Higgs vector here takes away only the neutrino part, and then you have this the lepton current here. And with this kind of operator, bounce from the LHC, for instance, would be would be softened, it would be weakened. Uh, while bounds from the neutron oscillation experiments could be more important. But even if you try to write dimension 8 operators, you still have a problem that many of these operators are very much suppressive. So this leads people to, to claim that um, uh, neutrino experiments, for most of the models that you can imagine, they cannot, um, they cannot be sensitive to new physics that colliders have not ruled out. So I, I will address this question as well together with the question of flavor. So let me go back to our flavor question. So the question is, um, can we have a uh, flavor dependent new interaction at low scales? And if we can have that, what is the price to pay for it? So uh, to address this question, first we need to, to decide which, um, uh, which symmetry we are going to, to, to gauge. And uh, this is, I'm, I'm not trying to solve any problem, any uh, anomaly here. I'm trying to prove a point. So the, 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 the symmetry one that you, we decided to gauge was the B minus L symmetry of the third family. So why did we do that? So first, um, B minus L is an accidental symmetry of the Sun model. And B minus L is anomaly free. So this, this is an interesting thing that happens in the Sun model that there are not so many anomaly free uh, symmetries in the Sun model. If you do B minus L, the anomaly cancel, the anomalies cancel within each family, right? So you don't need all three families to be gauged under B minus L. So you can pick one. And you could say that, you know, the third family quarks, they don't seem to mix much with the first two families. The first and the second they mix a lot, Kabi Boyan was like 0.2, but the, 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 the first and second with the third, they mix very little. So you could say maybe this is because the third family is protected by a symmetry and it's only through this breaking that you're going to mix. Maybe. But the point is we need to pick something, and we wanted to pick something that has an effect on both quarks and atoms. So we pick a B minus L of the third family. I'll typically refer to this gauge symmetry as U1X, <coughs> because U1 B minus L of the third family is a bit too long. Um, so um, yeah, essentially this is it. So let's gauge that, and with just saying let's gauge that, all the model will come, will come to us, right? There's, there's not much freedom there, because you need to generate CKM mixing, um, you need to generate neutrino mixing, and you have tons of experiments uh, that can put a bound on this kind of realization. So um, let's get our hands dirty a little bit. So um, what happens here? It's B minus of the third family, right? So we have up charm uh, down and strange with charge zero. So what's the scale of your B minus L symmetry? Oh, I didn't, I didn't say anything about that. I'll try to push as low as possible uh, because I want just to prove the point that this thing can be light. Okay. Uh, just, just to give an idea, uh, K on physics is going to be a killer. Mm -hmm. So you better be above 
roughly the KO mass. Yeah. But apart from that, the, the bounds are not so are not, are not as strong as we might think of. So, um, quarks of the first family of the first two families have no charge. Of the third family, they have charge a third plus a third. Um, and the leptons e mu nu e nu mu, they don't have a charge, while tau and nu tau have charge minus one. Uh, again, this is when I said b minus l of the third family. There is an assumption there that I'm pairing tops and bottoms, saying that this is my third family with uh, taus and nu taus, and there is no reason why I should do that, right? I mean, just because their masses seem to be like hierarchical, and you say third family is the heaviest one. There's absolutely no reason why this, the B minus L pairs these guys with these guys. You could have these on these guys with these ones, or these guys with, you know, e, 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 e nu e or mu nu. That would be fine. So, the first thing that happens there is that um, now I cannot generate CKM mix anymore, right? So, if, when I have my quark matrix, so let's say that this is uh, Q1, Q2, Q3. And let's say this is uh, U, uh, C, T, right? Q1 left, Q left, Q left. Um, with the usual Higgs boson, which has no charge, I can always write this, for instance, Q1 uh, Higgs U right. So let me call this Higgs phi 2, just for the sake of it. So I could do this with uh, the first two families, that would be fine. So I can generate these entries here. And the third family, Quark with the third family right and the quark, I can also generate with the usual Higgs because this, this has charge minus one third and plus one third, so it cancels out. But I cannot generate the mixing between these guys. So for me to generate this mixing, I would need an additional Higgs doublet. So that's the first thing that I need in my model. I, I, cannot, I cannot live without this Higgs doublet. So I need a Higgs doublet that makes me do phi one and some u right. So this has charge minus a third. This has charge needs to have a charge plus a third under the new symmetry, right? So the first point is that uh, let me just erase this. I have a phi one with charge plus a third. And now you see that in the up quark sector, I can generate these two entries here, but these ones are still zero. And in the Dow sector, uh, it's very easy to show because. Um, um, uh, this has no tilde, so I can do, where is that? Um, this would be zero, and you can generate these entries here, right? And then what happens is that um, a matrix like that, so this is, this is, this matrix is diagonalized by, by unitary transformation, and this by unitary transformation, as long as these elements here are small, is mostly a left hand rotation, right? This is just, like, you can do the calculation. Uh, if these things are small, you diagonalize it mostly by left-handed uh, rotation. If these things are the small ones, then it's mostly right-handed. So because um, the CKM matrix is uh, a matrix of rotations of left-handed, sorry, it's, uh, it's combined of left-handed up, uh, up and down rotations, um, we chose this to be zero just for the sake of it, just to say that we are going to use the minimum amount of, of, of things possible there to generate our CKM. These guys here, they barely contribute to CKM, so we set them to zero. Now, these things here, they are essentially going to be, they need to generate um, VUB and VCB, right? These guys here. So they need to be whatever they need to be. Um, now, uh, Um, there is another point, another particle here that I will need. Uh, sorry for the organization here, but I will also need a singlet scalar with charge plus a third. So this uh, phi one, it does not talk to the standard model. It does because you have phi one squared, phi two squared. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so you have so phi one is, is exactly like a Higgs. Yes, but charged so under the new symmetry. Okay, so phi one, phi one star, phi two, phi two star. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So in the scalar sector, we can have this. So we can have phi one, phi two, phi two, phi one. Yeah. So, or, you, so this one, do you use any weight to phi one? 
like oh, phi no, no. The, the thing is that phi one needs to have a path, and phi two would not induce would phi two induce then the, then the scale would be similar. Right? This is a good point. This is a very good point. Uh, you know, so this, I would say, so okay. So last point is that um, since I have a two Higgs doublet model, it's a simple two Higgs doublet model. It's not trivial to get these values completely different, right? Like I have, I, it's very difficult to get a value at uh, you know below one GV and the other one at two hundred fifty. So, so that's a good point, and actually, uh, yes, and there is a, a stronger uh, uh, problem if you try to get very different values. That you see, here I need to generate V U B, and uh, let's let's say V C D is better. So here I need to generate V C D, and uh, the way that I will generate V C D here, essentially, V C D will typically be something like Samyukawa, uh, the VEV of phi one. Uh, divided by the mass of the top, right? So you see here that, um, let me write this, let me put V2 and V2 here, and let me do this like Yukawa, um, V2 over M top, uh, I'm missing a root 2 here, just to speak to my the notation that I usually use. Um, and I will define, let me, so I will use this side to useful, for useful definitions that I don't want to erase. So I will define tangent beta as V2 over V1, right? So this is 1 over tan beta. Um, and if you say that tan beta is large, V2 is essentially mass of the top, right? Uh, V2 over root 2, so this factor is essentially 1. And, and now you see that um, y should be about, uh, let's see, VCB tan beta. So VCB is uh, 0.04. So if you, if you push for tan beta above 20, uh, 25, then you call it, this you count needs to be larger than 1. So you don't want to push for, if, I mean, you don't want to push for tan beta 50, right? Because then you would start to get super large Yukawas and this will soon become non perturbative On the other hand, the mass of the top, you can just redo the same argument, but the mass of the top would be V2 over M top. Uh, V2 is essentially 1, you don't need this tan beta there. Um, uh, sorry, you would need it for this argument that I'm saying. So you would need V2 over mass of the top, and you don't want the Yukawa to be so large, so this is like in a type 1 2 HDL or type 2, that tan beta should not be much below a half. So essentially, the, the, the natural scale of tan beta is between a half and maybe 25, right? If not, you have two, two larger cows in one side or in the other side. Um, so, so yes, so there's another important point uh, following what you just said that, oh, just as I told you, I will need a singlet scalar with charge plus a third, and, but that, that I'll make it clear why I did that soon. Um, so, another important point is the following, that, as you said, um, if I have the symmetry bro being broken by a Higgs, an additional Higgs, it is kind of nature that this symmetry is, that, is around the weak scale, right? That this, this entire model likes to live in the weak scale so that you don't have big hierarchies. But that means the following, that um, this this Higgs 1 here, this phi 1, that has SU2 charge and uh, U1 hypercharge and the new U1, will generate mixing between the Z and my new gauge boson, that we call X. And this mixing is very much constrained by electric precision tests, right? And now you said that uh, my theory likes to live at the weak scale because the, the, what breaks the symmetry is a weak, is a, is a doublet. So if you combine these two things, that the symmetry likes to live, the model likes to live in the weak scale, and you create some mixing here between the Z and the new gauge boson, that tells you that the new gauge coupling should be uh, small, roughly, you know, should be not so big. So to make this a little bit more precise, the mass of this new gauge ball is something like, uh, well, not something like, it's exactly this. It's um, G's, Gx is the gauge coupling of new symmetry, and then root of V1, V2, 
over v square v is 174 uh, plus map of the singlet square. And the mixing between this, this new gauge boson and the Z, if you want this like what happens in the sun model, right? The Higgs has charge on the rest of two and you want hypercharge. Since it has charge under both, it mixes W3 and the B and gives you the photon and the Z, right? This is the same. You have a guy that has charge on the tree, so it will mix w, W3, the B, and the initial X boson. And all the thing, the, the entire model will give you back the photon, the Z, and the, the physical X boson. So charge does not get contribution from this? No. Yes. No. So that's it. The, 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 the photon is still massless. Mm -hmm. And that, that's expected, right? Because now I have three symmetry groups, and you have two doublets breaking it. So you are never pointing out in the orthogonal direction that defines the photon. Um, yeah, so the mixing between these guys is given by uh, two terms, root of, oh sorry, the coupling of the new gauge boson divided by the coupling of the z, uh, and then you have v1 squared over v squared, where v1 is the value of the new the new uh, doublet. So if the new doublet has no value, you have no mixing as one would expect. So as I said, the electronic precision tests suggest that the the, the the, the gauge coupling is not so large, but now if you say that, for instance, just as an example, if the gauge coupling is, um, let's say, 10 to minus 2, and this thing is electroweak, so let's say 100 GV, just for the sake of it, you get the gauge boson mass at 1 GV. And it's a gauge boson that validates flavor, so this sounds very, very dangerous. Before I go into the details of the phenomenology, let me just brush a bit about the in the lepton side, so in the lepton side, something very interesting happens. Um, I'm focusing here in what we need to have because of the quark side. Uh, but we also need to generate neutrino mixing. And what happens is that we don't know what neutrino mixing, what the neutrino mass mechanism is, right? It, it is completely unknown. So um, as I told you, these guys here have charge minus one. These guys have charge zero, and I have absolutely no scalar that can connect these two things. So I cannot generate, with the present model here, I cannot generate the, the neutrino mix. Now, since I don't know what is the, the, the neutrino mass mechanism, I could just say that let's work with uh, effective field theory. So I could do this, for instance, um, for the first two families. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I keep writing. X uh, L by two <coughs> for the first two families, and this could generate you theta one two, the solar mixing angle. Uh, for the for the between the first two and the third, you could have something like this by one L sorry three phi one and S one uh, sorry S over lambda square. So you see you have chart. One third, one third, one third, minus one. So you cancel all these charges. Uh, and this could generate you both theta one three and theta two three. But now, you know that theta one three and theta two three are large, right? Like theta one three, a sine square of theta one three is about 0.1, and theta two three could actually be 45 degrees as far as you know. So that tells you the following, that since this, um, uh, what the, the, the effective field theory operators that generate you these mixing angles are of different dimension and they are all similar, it tells you that you have one of the two things, or you have fine tuning, so you have a miracle happening there for no good reason, or the so v2 squared over lambda is of a similar order of v1 squared vs over lambda squared. And as, as we discussed, that this thing should be all at roughly the weight scale. So it means that the, the mass, the, the scale that generates neutrino masses in this model is at the weight scale. So this is interesting because the following that um, typically when we do a seesaw at the LHC and things like that, there's no reason why a seesaw should happen at the LHC, right? We just do that because it's the only place we can search for. I mean, the LHC cannot search for 10 to the 13 GV, so we look at the TV scale. 
Here you have um, you have a theory motivation for why this lambda should be so low. If they are not low, then you need to have fine tuning. So there is there is a, 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 an interesting motivation for why you should look for the neutrino mass mechanism at the LHC here. I'm not going to go into more detail there. Um, I have one example of uh, neutrino mass generation that would work in this model. So, but I, I can talk about that uh, uh, later. All right. So, so this is it. This is the model. Uh, it's a very simple thing, right? I just have one additional doublet that I need to, to generate CKM mixing, and the coupling of this doublet to everybody is actually fixed because it's CKM. Um, and I have one singlet that. Uh, has some, some chart there because of phenomenology. I'll, I'll just tell you exactly what is that. So the usual comments uh, that I hear, I actually never heard these comments, but I keep saying that the usual comments that I hear, uh, is that at this point is that the model is ruled out, or, and I know this is not because I talk shit, or um, the gauge couplings are tiny, and this is like cheating, right? You just make a gauge coupling super tiny and then you you're avoid anything. And actually, uh, these two statements are wrong. Um, again, you know, if the model was ruled out, I would not have put on archive. Um, but doing, uh, making the gauge coupling smaller doesn't buy you much. And here's the reason why. Um, so how tiny is your gauge coupling? I'll, I'll show you a plot. I'll show you a plot. I'm just cooking you slowly. Mm -hmm. But I'll show you a plot soon. Uh, let me just write this. This things here, which can be useful, v1, v2, v plus vs, and uh, the mixing, which is two thirds gx root g square plus g prime square v1. Okay, so there are two important things. So the first one is that we are going to use a lot the equivalence uh, theorem. And the equivalence theorem is the following. Um, whenever I have an amplitude where I have uh, uh, on-shell gauge bosons, if the scale of my process is much above the mass of my gauge bosons, I can substitute the longitudinal mode of these gauge bosons by the goldstone associated to that. So essentially, it's telling you that if I had, um, um, for instance, fermion, fermion to gauge boson, gauge boson, I could, at very, very high energies, I could substitute that, let's say that this, let me just write like this in a Z, for instance. I could substitute that for uh, fermion fermion to the Goldstone associated to the breaking of the symmetry. And the important thing about that is that, of course, this is one of the motivations to build LHC, right? That we knew that something should happen before the TV scale, uh, if not some, something even more crazy was happening, or we, we didn't understand anything about quantum field theory. But here, I'm talking about gauge bosons that could be at the GeV mass. So anything that happens at 10 GeV is already like very high energy for this thing. So the important point here is that although you would think that your process would go like gauge coupling here square, that your amplitude would go like gauge coupling square, when you do this substitution, you see that the gauge coupling never enters here. There is nothing about the gauge coupling there. And this is what people typically call the longitudinal enhancement. That you get an enhancement of the energy of the process divided by the mass of the gauge boson square. <coughs> and then you get the gauge coupling square, and the mass of the gauge boson is related to the gauge coupling. <coughs> and therefore, um, the, came, the, the gauge coupling cancels. So this is actually related to some Yukawa coupling. Right? This is just, it's just a scalar set. So essentially, when you go to very high energy, the equivalence theorem tells you that it doesn't matter what you gauge it. You could have had a global symmetry because this mass is so small that this thing could be massless, and then the gauge coupling doesn't matter, it's just you powers. So that's one point that um, we are not going to be able to evade bounds by making gauge coupling small. The other point is that I'm going to show you in a second uh, the, the plot for the phenomenology to try to convince you that this thing could be this uh, gauge theory, flavor gauge theory could be at low scales. I'll show you a plot in this uh, uh, plane for fixed time beta. Um, and again, just going back to that argument of time beta, if you want to have your cows of order one for VCB, you would like to have time beta about 10 or so. 
Uh, so a bit larger than beta is, is kind of reasonable. Uh, in this plane, there is a region which is unphysical because if you look here in the mass of this gauge bosons, at the moment that I, I choose the, the value of tan beta, so I choose this relation, and I set this value of the scalar to zero, for a given gx I have my mass. And I cannot get a mass lower than that. I can always get a mass larger than that by, set, by making the value of the scalar larger. So essentially, this line here is vs equals zero, the value of this new scalar equals zero, the scalar singlet, and I move in this direction by setting vs not equal to zero, right? So let me see if I can show you a plot. Uh, constraints by making gauge capping going to zero because you still have the, the goldstone. And oh there and this is what you get. Uh, let me show you oh, let me show just this for, for now. Um, so what I have here is the mass of the gauge boson in units of GV. So it goes from one MeV to hundred GV. I didn't go above hundred GV because I want to focus on the light Okay, right? This is the gauge capping from 1 to 10 to the minus 6. And uh, uh, I'm not going to clean anything. And this is the mixing, uh, this mixing here. Um, so essentially for a given GX and tan beta, I have the equivalent mixing here. So I just put that to guide you. So you see, um, the plot is a bit busy, so let me guide you through it. Um, so the first bound, the, the, the easiest one, is uh, K on physics. So although I said that um, the, the flavor changing happened in the up sector, because that's what generates me my CKM, uh, via loops, um, uh, it doesn't matter exactly what these loops are, if you cannot see it, it's just the S going to D and emitting a gauge boson. Via loops, you actually can generate a very large K on to pi uh, a new gauge boson, and if this new gauge boson is light enough, you remember it couples to neutrinos of the third family, so it will decay to neutrinos, right? So the, the I think I have a plot of the branch ratios here. So this for two tan beta, let's look at this one, tan beta 10. You see that for the mass of this gauge boson below, I don't know, few GV, uh, it's 100% invisible and 10 to minus 6 uh, to visible stuff of branch ratio. And as you go to higher energy, then you open tau tau and dp, and these guys start to dominate to higher masses. But the point is that um, if the kaon goes to a pion and emits this new gauge boson, this gauge boson goes to neutrinos, you have this k to pi new new signature, which has a very, very, very strong, uh, gives a very strong bound. So the point is that um, although you have many suppressions here of VTD, VTS, etc., etc., you have what is called the longitudinal enhancement because if you want uh, for light masses you could put this guy the, the X boson as the goldstone and uh, let me check here oh you cannot see that here is a Fermi line you are exchanging tops here so this goldstone is coming to the top which has a larger Kawa and because of the flavor structure you cannot avoid this larger Kawa there's nothing you can do about it right if you don't have this U Kawa the top has no mass or you don't have VUV VCP so you need to have that. So this bound is very difficult to evade. And it's very strong because the kaon is very, uh, 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 not wide, thin, uh, narrow. narrow, exactly, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the kaon is very narrow, and the pressure ratio of k to pi nu is actually measured at the 10 to minus 10 uh, length. So essentially for the kaon you get this, uh, this big wall here, right, a dual light mass of the k on minus, minus mass of the pi. Now, there are other important bounds. For instance, um, upsilon to uh, a photon and a new gauge boson. So this bound would be, uh, where is the upsilon? This hatchet band here, right? Whatever is to this uh, region is excluded. Um, so 
usually people say that the upsilon cannot decay into two photons because uh, because of the Young's theorem that a vector cannot de decay into two massless vectors, right? It's just just angular momentum. But here the problem is that since this guy is gauged, uh, even when I set this the mass of this guy to zero, uh, I use my equivalence theorem again and I put a Goldstone boson, a uh, Goldstone bolt here, and the Goldstone is not a vector, right? So this guy can decay to photon and this this new gauge boson even if the mass of this new gauge boson goes to zero. And that gives you this strong bound that keeps going here forever because it's not probing the coupling or the mass, it's actually probing some new coupling. Um, there is uh, an interesting bound from Upsilon to Tau Tau. So this is actually a, a, a neat point that Upsilon to Tau Tau is one of the few processes that involves only third family uh, fermions. So in this case, uh, the bound is this here. So it flattens out because uh, if the gauge boson mass is too light, then it doesn't matter what is the mass, what matters is the, the, the center of mass energy, and this is the mass of the Upsilon. Uh, it gets stronger at the Upsilon resonance, and then it goes, grows weaker as this guy is heavier and heavier. Um, and uh, there is a very important bound, and I cannot, I cannot not mention it because I'm at Fermilab, uh, and Fermilab is neutrinos. So, all this red region here that you see, it comes from neutrino oscillations. And uh, you see that neutrino oscillation in some region of parameter space is even better than collider experiments. And this, is, this, this goes in the direction of answering that other question that I told you, can neutrino experiments actually probe any new physics that is not ruled out by collider? And there are two questions there. First is how neutrinos can probe this kind of model, and second, why are neutrinos competitive at all? Right. This is not clear, at least it was not obvious for us that it would be com uh, competitive. So how is it easy? Um, my tau neutrinos pop directly to this new gauge boson, and this new gauge boson via mixing with the Z because of that uh, uh, extra doublet that we had, talks to the rest of the, you know, to the first family uh, uh, fermions. And that induces uh, uh, an NSI, as I told you before, and uh, this NSI induces a matter potential that changes oscillation uh, uh, of, of beam neutrino, right? For instance, in minus. Uh, the change in oscillation you can see here, the, the, the blue line is the standard one, and the red is the equivalent of what we would have here for a very large value of this NSI. And you see that you can have a huge, a huge difference between, uh, um, well, a huge difference between the standard probability and the probability with this new uh, gauge boson. The other important point is that this NSI, is, I mean, you can actually calculate, it does not depend on gauge coupling at all, it has nothing to do with gauge coupling, it only depends on a combination of vacs. And if you set the value of that scalar that I told you, that single scalar to zero, then V1 cancels here, and V2 over, uh, v over V2 is always larger than one, so this NSI is always larger than three times the sum of all the value, which is ruled out for any region of parameter space you want. So, a combination of all other bounds would also rule, rule out this model uh, if there was no singlet scalar, but the neutrino oscillations alone rule out in the entire parameter space the presence, the, the model without the presence of this light, this uh, scalar singlet. So, solar neutrinos, uh, solar neutrino experiment also can constrain. Solar neutrinos could constrain that, but it's much more difficult because solar neutrinos, they, they create, in the sun you create uh, electron neutrinos. And they matter in this oscillation. But then, but you see that, 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 of that uh, NSI, you know, that matter effect is between tau neutrinos. But you bring in tau, it doesn't matter it's perfect. You could have some effect there. There, there is a bound, but the, the, strongest, the strongest bound actually comes from atmospheric. Uh, yeah. right? So you produce directly new mu and new tiles in the atmosphere and traverse the entire Earth to have a long baseline to feel this uh, matter effect. And then when you get your attack, you could have larger um, um, effects there. Also in the sun, it's a bit more tricky because you produce new E's, electron neutrinos, but the density in the sun is so large that you are actually per the electron neutrinos are uh, new twos in the sun for some energies. So it's a bit more tricky than that. So, so yeah, so this is how uh, neutrinos can constrain this thing, and there is a strong bound from atmospheric neutrinos on this epsilon tau tau that leads to this, this red region over there. Um, 
And why the Trinuscape constraint um, this guy is actually interesting because the first point is that the third family is very special for charged fermions, but not for neutrinos, right? In a noble fire detector, you have more neutrons than any other kind of neutrino, for instance. And this, it's, it's also true, may, well, it's partially true in minos, depending on which energy you're looking at. But it's definitely true, true in uh, T2K. And the other point is that the matter potential in neutrino oscillations, the matter potential does not uh, probe a gauge boson with a mass and a gauge coupling, etc., etc. It actually probes a vent of the breaking of a symmetry. For instance, in the Sun model, the matter potential is proportional to G Fermi. And G Fermi is 1 over V squared. And that's it. You don't have a gauge coupling there, you don't have anything like that. Now, if we can if we can probe an NSI that is 1% of the stun model effect, so an epsilon of 0.01, that means that we can we can probe an effective vet here 10 times larger than the weak scale, which means 2.5 dB. So if we can, can have percent precision uh, measurements of matter effects in neutrinos, we can actually probe uh, the TV scale. So this is why neutrinos are competitive to with other experiments. It is a very non-trivial and very uh, orthogonal way of looking at the TV scale, but this is what is happening there. So there are many other bounds. Oh, there is also this point that um, uh, with the neutrino side, things start getting very uh, uh, um, mixed because you have electrolyte new physics uh, probed by a zero momentum exchange process, which is matter effects, induced by GeV gauge bosons. So you get many, many, many different uh, uh, scales playing a role in this game. So um, let me just mention you uh, uh, what are the prospects for improving the epsilon tau tau bounds. So the Zepson tau tau bounds comes from atmospheric neutrinos, and this is the data for a super K. So you see that the red line here is the, uh, the uh, standard model, and you have the data points. And this is the equivalent for Dune, uh, only with statistical errors, right? So uh, there's still work to be done there, but it's not available yet. Um, but the point that, that you see is that, for instance, this dip here is much more pronounced in Dune than in teacher K, and that, uh, sorry, than in super K, and that, for instance, could improve uh, uh, your sensitivity to matter effects. So there is hope that Dune can improve the Zepson Tau Tau bound, but there is no uh, dedicated uh, analysis yet. So just to finish, uh, which I think I'm running over time, uh, or maybe not, but in any, in any case, uh, just to finish, to make sure that we could have this flavor gauge boson, this flavor gauge model at low scales, we calculated all the bounds that we could think of. So we, we did a B physics, D with it, atomic parity violation, D decays, D oscillations, which is this magenta region here, uh, neutrino oscillation, as I mentioned it to you, and KM physics, um, uh, neutrino scattering, uh, like coherent neutrino scattering, um, molar scattering, Higgs decays, and so it goes. And uh, there are two interesting uh, um, bounds that, that we think they could be improved by a lot. First one is a Z to BB and a gauge boson or tau tau and a gauge boson. Um, there's no dedicated search for that, um, at least that we could find. And, and, and what we use it just like the, 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 the Z partial width to B quarks, for instance, to, to put the bound there. But in principle, we could try to see uh, uh, the Z going to Bs and missing energy. And that, if you do a, if you do a, 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 a dedicated search for that, you could expect to improve these bounds here. They're not competitive right now, but if you improve them, they might be competitive. And the other one is that you could produce this guy at the LHC. So let me just use the blackboard one more time. Um, you could have, I hope you guys can see it here, right? Or maybe, well, that one's a bit cruel. Let me write about here, which I think everybody can see. You could produce these guys, uh, sorry, at the LHC like this. So you have BB and a new gauge boson. And then this gauge boson could decay uh, to thousands or Bs. Oh, thank you. Um, or neutrinos. Or neutrinos. So I would expect that the LHC is better for heavier uh, masses of this guy, about 10 GeV or so. 
Uh, at below 10 GB, you see that the bounds are super strong. I mean, for the LEDs, the bounds are kind of strong, right? Because they're like gauge couplings 10 to minus 2, or here 10 to minus 3, etc. But uh, if you go to, uh, let's say, 100 GB, uh, it's not clear that what happens there for this new bound, right? It seems that they all get weaker. <laughs> so there, the LEDs could shine, and, and, but the point is that, for instance, if you do this, B, B, Tau, Tau, that's tough. There is a search for laptop quarks which looks at exactly this, this, this final state, but they take the B, the B tau pair and try to reconstruct the laptop quark uh, resonant mass so that they can feel the background. Without that, I'm not entirely sure uh, how can you do it, uh, how well can you do it. But that uh, dedicated study would be, uh, would be interesting for that. So um, I think, yeah, I think I said everything I wanted to say. Um, so just to, to highlight one more time, uh, if we look here, we have a flavor gauge symmetry where the, all the scalar sector is realized at the weak scale. Um, the gauge coupling could be, for instance, 10 to minus 2, or even 2 times 10 to the minus 2 for a mass of 1 GB, and nothing bad would happen. Right? The guy could be there lurking just one order of magnitude below the standard model gauge count, right? So if you think the hypercharge, the G prime is 0.3, and hypercharge of quarks is like uh, 1 over 6. So the, the gauge count times hypercharge is about is below 0.1. So you could have this, this, this new guy here with a relatively large coupling uh, violating flavor, and nothing, nothing bad would happen. So to conclude, um, I hope I could convince you that um, there could be flavor-dependent physics way below the weak scale, at the GV scale or so. Uh, the interesting thing about this, this class of code is that it comes up with a big synergy between very, very different physics. For instance, atomic parity violations, Higgs os uh, neutrino oscillations, Higgs decays, and, and B decay, and so on. And uh, I, I cannot, I cannot uh, forget to mention that uh, neutrino experiments can be sensitive to physics beyond the reach of collider experiments. It's not obvious because the way neutrino experiments are probing uh, the TEV scale is very orthogonal and very non-trivial, non but uh, in principle neutrino experiments can be sensitive to this new physics. And maybe, just there's a food for thought, maybe, maybe the, the B anomalies are pointing to some flavor-dependent new interactions, right? Uh, uh, there seems to be anomalies in a uh, uh, B decay into muons, decay, uh, the, the, the D decay into tau, and so on. So, so let's let's see, let's see what happens. So, thank you. Are there any questions? So, scale X can be high as 100 GB. Sorry. The scale X can be heavy. The scalars can be heavy. So, their their values are about the weak scale. So in principle, you could you could imagine that they could be at the 500 GeV or so. There is um, there is a bound coming from B to S gamma on the mass of the charged scalars. Like this is a known bound for type one and type two to ATMs, and we expect this bound to be about 400 450 GeV for the mass of this charged scalar. But but we could we could get there with, without any problem with no fine tuning. On that explosion plot, what does it look like when you go uh, beyond another G? We didn't. Okay. Um, and we didn't because of, so, um, if we go above 100 GeV, um, I mean, I'm sure that if you go above a few hundred GeV, then it becomes something that people have already studied, right? Like Probably, yeah. a few hundred GeV flavor Z primes, etc., etc. Like there are LHC searches on, uh, um, uh, QQ going to Z prime going to tau tau or BB, mm -hmm. and these bounds are very strong. Okay. But maybe like maybe in this region between 100 and 200 something, you could have something interesting there. Just we decided that uh, yeah, five orders of magnitude was enough. Yeah. So we had a talk um, uh, telling us about how we're gonna get a good sensitivity to the top view color uh -huh. using the four top channel. Right. Which you do get here. Yeah. And you get two tops. One of them spits out an extra yes. more. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, like that. That uh, this guy here. Yeah, yeah. Did you, you go to TTTT, right? Yeah, you like back of the envelopes and see, like, what does it look like? Is this promising? So this could be promising. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, actually, with uh, with a student at uh, Oklahoma State University, uh, Sudip Jana, uh -huh. and Babu, we are looking at uh, BB to Tau Tau and and maybe TT to Tau Tau or, or four tops. We're looking at what what this could this could do at the LHC. Um, so yeah, I mean, in principle, we could have that. The cross section is not huge, but uh, it's uh, none of these cross sections are right. So yeah. Um, I have one more crap box question. Um, so what, if you're going to look at um, the rate of tau neutrinos in cosmic ray observatories. Is that, does that have any chance of telling you anything? Because, I mean, no, I cosmic rays are, you know, this is the high energy, the highest energy collider we have, actually. Um, well, more or yeah, less, right? It's, uh, it, this is a tricky well, question. Well, 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 yeah, okay. You could say that um, I have PV neutrinos coming at ice cube, yeah. but we are barely touching the double resonance, right? So this is like energy is lower than light. So it's, it's a bit tricky. It's a bit tricky. The, the, but the problem I see you using a cosmic tau neutrinos is that if these tau, if these neutrinos in general are originated from uh, from far away, if it's not originated in the atmosphere, if it's anywhere in the galaxy, you have already oscillated, and the oscillations tend to mix all the flavors, right? Because all the mixing angles are big. So if you change uh, the quantity of tau neutrinos by five percent, who knows, right? Like there's no there's um, nothing there because but, but, but like uh, Ice Cube and um, Ariana they, they they can distinguish atmospherically generated neutrinos from carbon from extragalactic neutrinos like okay, they can see that this is, okay, this is something that hydrogenizes in our sky yeah yeah um, and and then if you have a higher rate of tau neutrinos yeah you don't so so, so, so what I, what I'm saying is that if you have tau neutrinos from atmospheric neutrinos the problem is that now atmospheric neutrinos become a background right so. Uh, new moves typically oscillate into new taus, mm -hmm. and this is done a model. So if you generate more new taus, then you need to know very well how many new moves are oscillating to uh -huh. new taus, and, and what is the flux of new moves to start with, and all that. Okay. And these have large uncertainties. If you look at the astrophysical ones, the problem is that um, you could come up with these flavor triangles. So the idea here is uh, uh, the flavor triangles. They, they are not trivial to, to see, but the idea is that I think it's like this. The idea is that the point here you project like here you get the quantity of nu e, you project there is a quantity of nu tau, and you project there is a quantity of nu mu. Mm -hmm. And even if you start with an original uh, uh, neutrino flavor of only tau neutrinos, say you have a crazy source that only gives you tau neutrinos, mm -hmm. because all the mixing angles are big. You end up in the middle of okay. the of the flavor triangle. It doesn't matter what you do; you always end up close to the middle of the flavor triangle. Right. So, so if you if you change something here, you know, you will need to change this by a lot, and make sure that this change can it will not be washed out by oscillations. So that that's tough. That's difficult. So I I, I don't think this would give you a, a very strong bound. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. The LHCB, there is no process at the LHCB that can go So, uh, well, there is the Upson studies, yeah, right? So, uh, all the Upson studies could do that, like Upson to Tau Tau or Upson to uh, Photon and nothing. Um, there is, there is um, in principle, depending on how you cook up your scalar sector, you could have. Uh, B to S to mu, B sub S to mu, mu, right? And we could try to explain these anomalies and things like that. But that would typically depend, depend more on the scalar sector than on this gauge boson. I mean, you could do something with this gauge boson, but since it's too light, you might be able to explain one beam of this anomaly, but not, not the three beams where you see the excess. I think it's three beams, right? Where you see the excess. So, so in principle, we can try to do something there, but then I guess it would depend a bit more on the on the scalar sector. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, so we will have our two camp chats and the fourth floor special room. Just like this before more.